What happened after the British left Washington? Asked Adele as she looked down at her grandfather from the highest hay bale. As you can imagine, Grandfather Lafitte replied, the British were feeling very confident. If they were confident, it means they believed they could win. They had defeated the U.S. Army in Washington and destroyed the capital. They planned to capture Baltimore next, which at the time was a very important port. What is a port? asked Adele. A port is a town or city where ships stop to load and unload cargo. Baltimore was a deep water port, meaning that the water was deep enough for really big ships to sail in and dock there. Baltimore was a port where ships could send and receive goods such as flour, tobacco, and sugar, explained Grandfather Lafitte. Besides that, Baltimore is a central location between New York and Philadelphia to the north and Washington to the south. But for the British, it would provide a place to land a huge invading army. So if the British destroyed the capital and then captured Baltimore, they would gain the advantage, said J.P., an advantage is something that gives someone a better chance to accomplish something. That's right, said Grandfather Lafitte. Capturing Baltimore was a key part of the British plan. From there, they hoped to attack other important cities. But I will tell you what actually happened. The Battle of Baltimore can be divided into two parts. The battles on land and the battles at sea. The British general in charge of the attack on Washington, D.C., thought that they could capture Baltimore as easily as they did the capital. Oh, boy, sighed J.P. These cats are interested in the story, too. At that moment, a second barn cat had come to join the first one. The second cat was attempting to sit on J.P.'s chest. That's not what happened, though, continued Grandfather Lafitte. The people of Baltimore knew that the British were coming, and they prepared themselves for a fight. A commander of the U.S. Army ordered that huge earth banks, called entrenchments, be built along the eastern side of the city. They knew that the British soldiers would have to begin their attack there. Sure enough, one September morning, the British landed several thousand soldiers at a place called North Point. What is an entrenchment? Adele repeated the word she didn't understand as she dangled a long piece of string above a barn cat's head. Entrenchments are structures created to protect an area and the people in it. Entrenchments can be made by either digging into the ground or by building walls above the ground. The entrenchments acted as defensive walls and as a means of targeting the advancing army, explained Grandfather Lafitte. In addition to building the entrenchments, the army got ready to defend Fort McHenry. Was the purpose of Fort McHenry to protect Baltimore's harbor? asked J.P. Yes, Fort McHenry was a defensive fort located right on the bay. A fort is a strong building used to protect soldiers. It was built in the shape of a five-pointed star. Soldiers were perched on the tip of each star point to protect the fort from all directions. The U.S. Army knew that they had to try to keep the British soldiers out or they would surely lose. The British soldiers began to advance on the city. They kept coming until they were finally pushed back by a large U.S. Army. Did the British give up? asked J.P. Not yet, replied Grandfather Lafitte. They withdrew or pulled back and set up camp. The next morning, the battle continued. The British marched right up to the entrenchments at North Point. This time, they didn't just face a larger U.S. Army, but lots of cannons and other weapons, too. The British quickly realized that they were outgunned. They retreated, and we won the Battle of North Point. But what happened at Fort McHenry? asked Adele. That's quite a story, said Grandfather Lafitte as he laughed quietly. The people of Baltimore had imagined that they were in for a long, hard fight. And so they prepared for one. Besides building entrenchments, they stored supplies. They even sank some of their own ships so that the British would not be able to sail into the harbor. They sank their own ships? asked J.P., astonished. Yes, they did, explained Grandfather Lafitte. 
Another important part of the preparation included the creation of a new flag for Fort McHenry. The commander of the fort, George Armistead, wanted a flag so big that the British sailors would be able to see it from far away. A lady named Mary Pickersgill was asked to make the flag. I read about this in a book once, said Adele. Mary Pickersgill needed help to make such a big flag. She did indeed, replied Grandfather Lafitte. Her daughter, her two nieces, and a young apprentice helped. The flag that these five women made had fifteen stars and fifteen stripes. When it was finished, the flag was as large as a house. It was actually bigger than the room they were making it in. Mary Pickersgill's flag measured thirty feet tall by forty-two feet wide. It was carried to the fort and would later be hung on a giant flagpole. Do you know how many stars and stripes our flag has today? There are thirteen stripes and fifty stars, J.P. said confidently. The thirteen stripes represent the thirteen original colonies, and the stars represent our fifty states. Excellent, exclaimed Grandfather Lafitte. Now let's get back to the story. Before long, the British began firing rockets at Fort McHenry. At first, the British ships were too far from the fort for the U.S. soldiers to be able to return fire. For more than twenty-four hours, the British pounded on the fort. Twenty-four hours is one whole day and one whole night. With little return fire, the British ships sailed closer and closer to the fort. Once they were close enough, though, our soldiers were able to return fire. That must have sounded like a terrible thunderstorm," said Adele. "Probably louder than the fireworks on the Fourth of July," added J.P. "Did we hit any British ships?" J.P. asked. "We sure did," said Grandfather Lafitte. "In fact, the British ships were forced to pull back. They kept firing, though." However, early the next morning, the British realized that they had not been able to take over the city. They stopped the attack, and the British ships sailed away. During the night, the fort had flown a smaller flag. But as the British stopped firing and prepared to sail away, the commander George Armistead directed the army to raise the enormous flag that Mary Pickersgill and her helpers made. Wow! Exclaimed J. P. and Adele together. Grandfather added, "A man named Francis Scott Key watched the whole battle that night from a boat just outside of the Baltimore Harbor. He saw bombs shooting through the air and watched the rockets rain down all through the day and into the night. As the sun came up, Francis Scott Key was still on the boat. When he saw that enormous flag flying, he knew that Baltimore had been saved. The United States won the battle." Francis Scott Key wrote our national anthem," explained J.P. "That's right. The events that morning inspired Francis Scott Key to write a poem that later became our national anthem," added Grandfather Lafitte. "The word 'inspired' means to have caused or influenced him to write the poem." "Come on, J.P.," announced Adele. "Let's sing the national anthem for Granddad." The two children stood up in the warm sunshine and looked at their grandfather. Together, they sang the words that Francis Scott Key was inspired to write that morning so long ago. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets' red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night. That our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave?
When the children were finished, Grandfather Lafitte smiled proudly at them. With his arms around their shoulders, he said, Why don't we head back up to the house for a late afternoon snack? You might even hear something about those pirates, too. Sounds good to me, said Adele as she scrambled down from the hay bales. The word scrambled means to have hurried quickly over something. Oh, pirates, exclaimed J.P. Then together the three walked back toward the house with their two furry friends at their heels.